Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and frequently if you've been following this podcast, we often talk about elite capture in Pakistan, the role of what I frequently refer to as a kleptocracy in stymieing reform and making sure nothing ever really changes in terms of the political economy of the country. And this question that I frequently posed is how do you convince the beneficiaries of the status quo? to fundamentally change the status quo that has to happen. Um, but one conversation that we don't frequently engage as much as we perhaps should on is the role of the international community in ensuring Pakistan remains the way it is or playing a role in sort of reinforcing the kleptocracy in, in a way. Uh, we've had some guests talk about it a little bit, most notably uh, Ayaz Malik, dear friend of mine. He's been on two episodes in Urdu talking about from his view of the left uh, in terms of how Pakistan fits into the global capitalist ecosystem that's there and how then geopolitical rents have been at the core of keeping the country financially and economically afloat and how now when there are no such rents available, the situation is getting tighter and tighter. Well, today we're going to continue that discussion uh, with a dear friend of mine, Zima Chima. She's the founding director at Verso Consulting a Pakistan-based collective of practitioners leading the portfolio on conflict, fragility, and violence, has a long experience as a researcher working with civil society in Pakistan, governments and international organizations looking at the political economy and conflict in the country. Uh, so Azima, welcome to Pakistanomy, and thank you for taking out the time today. Thank you for having me. So let's begin. This is a conversation you were and I and some of us were having offline uh, in, a, in a private setting in terms of, you know, yes, we can talk about elites in Pakistan and their role. And many of us do talk and critique that. Uh, but your point was, well, we also have to critique and, and look at the role of global elites in terms of what's going on in Pakistan and their role. Um, so maybe just start uh, by framing that point of yours so for the audience. I'm familiar with it, but let's start with your broad thesis on this, and then we'll go into the specifics of where the problems may lie. Sure. Um, so I think the, the statement that I reacted to had to do with somebody quoting a particular instance of... Um, a diplomat to Pakistan having made a public uh, analysis on Pakistani elites who essentially, you know, they profit off of Pakistan, but when it comes time to, to invest or when it comes time to party, they'll be found in London and so on and so forth. And, and that argument generally rankles, right? And it rankles because it, it holds the echoes of a, you know, a, a standard problem that we have identified in Pakistan is that a Pakistan as a whole in the international discourse is problematized. Pakistan the problem, right? And within that, the specific problem, i.e. where to lay blame, is on elites, Right. And there's this sort of amorphous notion of elites. But when they get specific, there is some exclusivity there. And we are talking exclusively about political elites. Right. Now, that's also the domestic discourse. Right. That is a, what we are engineered into. That is what our vernacular in common political parlance across all communities and all strata is. It's a criticism of the elites, a criticism of corruption, but really almost exclusively around political elites. And so it rankles for, first of all, for that reason, which is that exclusivity of political elites in the discourse. And secondly, it just feels like it's a bit of a lazy analysis. Now, as I mentioned to you right before we, we hit the record button on this, is that this is not an area. I mean, I'm a researcher, right? So so for me, it's it's uh the the goal is to dig deep into finding the answers. And this was a you know, sort of an unstructured thought that we had uh in, in that's come up in several of our research projects, is essentially we hit a wall. Sometimes 
when we are talking particularly because the background I come from is the development sector. And we, when we are talking about elite capture, when we are talking about rules of business in Pakistan, we're essentially seeing the same patterns again and again and again, which overall, the, the bottom line of it is that the analysis points to the lack of a conception or discourse on what is the public good. So within Pakistan, we have, we have a very poor discourse on the public good. Can you think of like any clear examples where, where the public good has kind of been, been the central argument? I think the biggest argument on the public good side so far, if I can think off the top of my mind, right, has been this argument that Imran Khan pushed for a number of years and continues to push, which is corruption is the biggest problem. And right. if you solve for corruption, the public good, whatever this amorphous idea might be, as he explains it, uh, would be solved for. And, and we would have the money, the $200 billion that I think Murad Saeed would frequently cite and Imran Khan would then take a leaf out of that imagination, imaginative figure as well, would be we would bring this luti hui dalat back and right. the country would prosper. That that I think is the, or if then if I were to go to the flip side and look at the PML Noon's discourse, their public good would be the mega infrastructure projects, the highway and the power plants as the symbols of that public good, because that's what delivers growth and, and prosperity. I think, I don't know how you think about this, but that's my immediately comes to my mind as the two big definitions of public good in the Pakistani context politically. Well, hold that thought, especially on the, on the, on the Sharifs and the infrastructure, because I will bring it back to that. But when you start off with, again, this idea that Imran Khan has sold in particular, which is that you, the victim, you, the Pakistani population, you have been stolen for all that wealth is sitting outside. We will bring it back. Right. It's very, very similar to we'll get out of the EU and we will bring all this money into the NHS. At least there was a defined idea. There was a defined set of expectations where the discourse is better. You have more specificity as to what the public good is. So for that, they had to say NHS, right? You're going to put all this money into the NHS. Well, Hansa would say, sorry to interrupt again, Hansa would say the money would be used to pay off the debt. Precisely, right? Uh, the money would be used to pay off the debt. Uh, but also, there's no how in there. And when you look at Khan Saab and his put, and you do an accounting of the distribution of wealth, Khuram Hussain is, this is a great like resource for explaining how decisions taken under that lead to, you know, concentration of wealth into the hands of 600 people or so, you know, you have more and more of these examples of more of the same. Because when you actually analyze the behavior of political elites, you realize that they cater to other elites. Now, among our, let's say various elites, you know, in Pakistan, we have the military elites, you have the administrative elites, you have the political elites and the business elites. And now let's just talk about the four of these. And right? just to add to it, because we've had a researcher on the podcast, Dr. Rosita Armitage, mm -hmm. wonderful book, in my view, Big Capital in an Unequal yeah. World. She's also in a research shows they're all intermarried, right? So the elites you described, if you begin to look at the makeup of their families, or talk to them, and I've had, you probably have had the same experience, you realize that they're all married to each other. I remember watching a video log of Umar Chima explaining sort of the issues with the current makeup of like the cases that are ongoing on the judicial side, the military side, the political side. And the way he was explaining it ended up being koi kisi ke khala ka beta hai, koi kisi ke chacha ki ladki hai. Koi, they're all married as well. I just wanted to add that for the audience's context as well. Yeah, and you are talking about literal marriages. And what I'm trying to say is that there's a figurative marriage at play here, right? Every time we, and and this is, you know, sort of, I mean, I, I think Rosita's written an important book, right? But she's looking at business elites that not necessarily, and she's been very clear about the fact that she's not looking at military elites. 
And so my problem with this particular argument around the political elites in the business economy, in the in Pakistan's political economy, is that these if of these four groups of elites, there is only one that has to demonstrate some contribution to the public good to survive. And that's the political elites. They have to spend on elections. They have to spend on campaigns. They have to spend something in the constituency, right? So end of the day, of course, political elites who spend as much as they do on campaigns, you know, talking about like 30 crores sometimes, right, here in, in, in our modern election math, is a kind of money that's going to be spent on some of the more contested big constituencies. They're thinking, how are we going to recover this later? So, of course, they have their own profits and their own interests tied along with that. But among these four elites, you have other elite groups that have no responsibility to demonstrate and no sets of rules and no accountability to demonstrate anything to the public good. Also, pitching the conversation around political elites to me seems like it's 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 addressing half the problem you're kind of ignoring the hierarchy of the problem. To me, the set of rules that political and business elites operate under are a subsidiary set of rules to the set of rules set by the military elites, particularly as it governs, you know, the various um, businesses, I think the real estate empires are, are, are a great example of that, right? So when you're talking about uh, the military's investments in real estate, when you're talking about, um, uh, you're, when you're talking about, um, again, a lot of the development economy that was inherently tied to the global war economy, that's where my attention turns is let's look at the influence of the global war economy on Pakistan, because in my view, it's been a very, very big influence. And in that influence, political and administrative and business elites have set up rules of business that are aligned to protect those interests. And so you have repeated budget cycles where you see the same dispensation, that same settlement again and again and again, right? The, the, the housing societies are protected. The tax benefits to the business elites are protected. Administrative elites come away with raises. right? And then political elites get to try to manage the, the, the fallout with the public. Well, that's a very interesting way to put it because that, that's a good framing uh, in the sense of two things that come to mind. One, as we hit record today, there's a circular that is there on uh, my screen and, and your screen as well, probably, that the SIFC budget for the secretariat, there's a supplementary grant application for 200 million rupees. And based on my conversations, at least with people, um, they're saying, well, there's a list of projects that the boys are beginning to put together to sort of, you know, use the SIFC to pass through and grow their military ink empire, if you were to call it that. Um, which again is brings me to that point that anyone who tries to study it the way Dr. Aisha Siddiqua did is then, you know, become public enemy number one or number is on that A list of public enemies because you don't want to shed a light on that. And your point on rules of business, the second point that came to my mind was through my own research. I've been looking at uh, a book uh, writing. I wrote a draft book chapter recently on the military's growing influence on the economy. And in that, I stumbled upon something very interesting a few years ago. This was under the Khan government uh, when a new seed policy was supposed to be debated and, and put forward. And somehow the ISI and the MI were part of the debate on seed policy and said, well, we cannot allow GMO seeds to enter because it's a national security threat. And that was the news reports that were out. And when I dug deeper, it turned out that the Army Welfare Trust and the Fauji Foundation run their own seed companies. So if you allow GMO seeds to come in, uh, their market share, one could plausibly argue, 
would come down substantially because they don't have the IP that a foreign company like a Bayer would be bringing or a Monsanto would be bringing into Pakistan after all the tests are done. And then it went nowhere, right? So it reinforces your point on the hierarchy. But then help explain, help the audience understand how this hierarchy functions and what, in your view, has been the long-term role and influence of the global war economy in shaping the domestic political economy of Pakistan? Yeah, I mean, again, I would, you know, you had uh, asked me this question about, you know, what are the the historical factors? And I, by the way, Uzair would encourage you to take this as a two part, uh, a, a two part conversation, right? One is with me, who is the modernist, who is essentially looking at the international community's engagement in Pakistan in the contemporary or at least the last uh, 20, 30 year context and saying, look, what has come out of that and how does that work and who does it benefit? Um, and then you have somebody uh, who I spoke to to sort of just pick his brain is um, the Khalos on Twitter. As a historian, he will come up with a fantastic list of um, which I'll share with you just now. He came up with a fantastic list of historical events that he thinks that it shaped, in particular, how this, uh, how the water, the global war economy, and Pakistan's participation in the global war economy, and how how that has turned out. And those, I mean, I'll give you a quick list: uh, um, the Korean War. Uh, gave Pakistan an export boom, uh, the Baghdad Pact. Uh, you had, you know, a certain, you know, the number of defense pacts here, CETO, CETO, etc. Uh, the post-1973 oil embargo, right? Uh, the, the end of the Cold War, the U.S.-India nuclear deal and how that shaped Pakistan's own internal dynamics and position, strategic positioning. Um, you have, and in the modern space, you have the China Belt and Road uh, Initiative, right? Like, so there are a number of factors where we are having this conversation at a moment when you've pointed this out already. There is a struggle for relevance. Pakistan at this moment is struggling for uh, so struggling to demonstrate relevance to global elites. And but just to be on past, the same page, so again, to just be clear yeah. if we're on the same page, the struggle in my mind for relevance is primarily there. The need to figure this out domestically is there among elites. And I mean, the broad elites that you define, particularly the military elites, is that that relevance then unlocks geopolitical rents that are critical to the operation and of the domestic political economy. Are we on the same page on that? We're entirely on the same page, specifically because that the, the, the business model that Pakistan, and this is the way I see it. And again, the, this is something that I think needs a lot of further research. And again, I'm agnostic on the the what should and should not happen. The fact of the matter is, and I and I make this point again and again, Pakistan is here, 240 million people whose interests and well-being are inherently tied into this structure. So that's a lot of collateral damage if everything goes wrong, right? And also that you have a military that has been a participant, that's a very, very strong actor, and that strong actor has emerged because that is the primary actor that has been, that has been a um, counterpart for the international community, right? And of course, you are absolutely right that we are essentially talking about geopolitical rents here, but we're also talking about, when I look at that model, I'm wondering, the rentiership model is just one tool in the box to do business. Whether you are doing rentiership as peacekeepers, great thing, that's good rentiership. Whether you are doing um, a positive rentiership in terms of engaging with um, other actors in the Middle East, and that is one area from where global elites have engaged with Pakistan and helping, invested in Pakistan. Helping secure and the, the, holy, the holy Pakistan. kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
Yes, but we have, uh, you know, we have these old relationships and it is within those old relationships and particularly in our current moment where this demonstration is coming into effect that we are struggling to demonstrate relevance, right? We have usually had something to sell, whether it is cheap labor or expensive security, that menu should have grown by now. Right. The the two, three models of rentiership, three models, really, of rentiership that have been deployed should have been supplemented with additional business models of brokerage, for instance. And, and, and that is why, for instance, the Chinese relationships are so important. Because, you know, when you look at Pakistan's uh, engagement there, there is, you know, an opportunities for brokerage, for growing kind of, you know, networks in terms of. Um, you know, developing and selling air platforms, etc. So whatever the opportunity pool now is very, very small. And the negotiating position is a very desperate one. And that is because, again, the, the global war economy has changed. So if we imagine, you know, that Pakistan has some participation in the global war economy now, it would be around, you know, Ukraine, for instance, right? And and as a as a you know sort of a, I think for the region a fairly important security actor, this uh, the 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 global focus on Pakistan as the problem, it hasn't. It has obscured, that discourse has actually obscured that the international community has almost exclusively engaged in this space again and again and again. And when you try to, to, to see what impact that had on the public good, and I think our intellectuals have been making this point again and again, that um, it reinforced autocracies, right? And it reinforced aut autocratic decision-making. Um, you had financial incentives to go along, we have very, very strong financial incentives. And to answer the question that I know you're going to ask me later, is what needs to change for domestic, political, and business elites in order to deliver more for the people? I think the, 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 those in, that incentive structure wholesale does not exist. Yeah, so we'll get to the solution part in just a moment. But if I were to go one level deeper on this right, and get your view on something that has been in my mind as well is, OK, you look at the the set of countries that have engaged primarily, let's say, with the West over the in the post-World War II order on similar terms that Pakistan has as initially being a security centric engagement sort of partner, right? You have Turkey, you have Egypt, you have Israel, you have South Korea. Those are the four that at least in the Asian context come to my mind. Greece to an extent was there, Chile and Latin America, etc. But let's not get, get into, into that region because it has its own complicating and unique factors. But in the Asian context, if I look at the South Koreans, the United States supported an autocracy there, but an autocracy that modernized and wanted to modernize and define the public good in a very different and unique way. In the Turkish case, the secular military elite, through the rise of Erdogan at least, did coups and all sorts of stuff, but still delivered on a broad definition of Turkish national public good and delivered on that and an economy that continued to be modernizing and industrializing and becoming a force uh, in the region itself. The Israelis are a case in point, the startup economy, quote unquote, and the deep research linkages that they have with Silicon Valley and DARPA and all of that. Um, and then Egypt and Pakistan are sort of on the other side of this where they haven't been able to do. Your view, what's your view on why and how did the military elites in Pakistan fail to sort of go towards the more South Korean model or even the Turkish model of defining a public good and then investing in that even though it was driven by initially the security centric engagement with the West, where did Pakistan and Pakistan's military elites go wrong in, in that sense? Or what did they miss? Yeah. 
So the examples that you've quoted, the ones that you're saying on the wrong side of the tracks are the two post-colonial contexts. And that makes, and, and, and that's not necessarily just a phenomenon of military elites. Look, our institutions are inherently, because of the post-colonial legacy, oriented to public management, not public service. And that particular orientation means that there's a very poor state society compact, right? There's a very poor um, set of mechanisms for state for uh, citizen engagement and citizen inclusion. And you have competing groups of elites also where this dispensation as, you know, we've transitioned occasionally out of autocratic governments and we've transitioned, we've had these, these, we've been punctuated by periods of democracy, right? And what happens, and this is where I'm going to bring you back to that conversation uh, that that point that you had made earlier for instance about the sharifs and and their infrastructure development and how that becomes a public good argument well then that starts to demonstrate here there is another actor there's another kid on the block that can demonstrate uh infrastructure development that also has a public good benefit and it's not just about the nlc and it's not just about uh you know military aligned contractors so here you have the way the competition right like one of the best things that somebody explained to me is that everybody in pakistan does somebody else's job right one of the things that we find repeatedly because we you know we're fairly prolific i just add to it that everyone does everything but their jobs and that's the fundamental problem over here and so so here we are when we are talking about and this is something we find on a fairly regular basis uh administrative elites have a fundamentally different view of what needs to happen on the ground than uh than the kind of views that we get from local communities right i think one of the great examples of how these processes can 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 how that elite capture uh, can influence these various processes is I think that you have to, to look, for instance, at the FATA merger and the politics of the FATA merger, right? Um, you had a civilian government in power that had enough of a signal that the, from from the, the the military that they thought that it was time and that it was it was okay to go ahead with it. There was a narrow window. There was a lot of skepticism. Uh, in the tribal areas who were just recovering from war. And the first set of processes that was supported again by the international community. I mean, you see, look, the 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 the, the phenomenon of the the global war economy is that they reinforce the military elites in Pakistan. Now, the phenomenon of the international development community is that they reinforce administrative elites in Pakistan. And the kind of impact that you have then in Pakistan's development sphere on such a big sort of, I think, a fairly significant political process is that there was serious inclusion, like the ex it was it's seriously exclusive of local interests. In fact, one of the first UN supported processes led to a document and, the, um, and, and you had to see the list of who was involved in it. And uh, and you had, you know, the, the the local communities and local tribal elders kind of putting that document in front of you and saying, is McCorn here tribal? Like, who did they ask? They have built a roadmap and you had, you know, politicians in there who were trying very hard and they were straddling a very fine line to go and convince uh, the local community saying, look, the fact that we have a window to change things, the fact that we have a window to do away with the FCR means that, it, 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 that we have to take advantage of the window. And yes, it's not going to come to something perfect, but it's a beginning to change. So please, please, please support us. And on the other hand, you also have this, this sort of, you know, a, 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 a region that historically has had a, like, I think that extreme example of a public management orientation, right? And that was the relationship that existed between the administrative elites and uh, the community. All we do again and again is we co-opt local elites. 
we go out local elites in order to achieve buy in for so development me, if i may on the farta point this is a thought that just came uh, to my mind i've been reading this book the dawn of everything you know i'm four mm-hmm. chapters in it's a fantastic read about that sort of redefines or begins at least i'm not done with it yet begins to redefine this idea of the hobbesian world and the rousseau ideas and where all of this came from and the argument the book makes is that well it was a lot of this thought of individual rights and liberties and freedom as they were defined in the west uh, in that era the 1700s etc um yeah. were out of a conversation with um the indigenous people of north america and their philosophies and their way of governing themselves and people forget and the, the book gets into you know how and why this happened and your point on ignoring the locals and sort of reinforcing administrative elites or military elites do you then also think that this is perhaps also part of this whole western idea which has now become mainstream even our elites in pakistan come out of the western ideas of philosophical understanding etc is that the locals are so they're not modern therefore they don't have the right set of ideas or understandings or the nuances in terms of how a modern state should function and how the modern law should be implemented and how the modern administrative state should engage with local communities therefore the idea is well why do you want to engage with a tribal elder because they're quote unquote primitive right my view would be perhaps i don't know what you think about this that perhaps that's also the belief and we see this a lot in pakistan at least is that wo jailon ko kya pata right that's a very traditional view of approaching ke local community se yeah. baat karne ka fayda nahi usko to pata hi nahi hai ye cheezein chalti kaise hain yeah. is uh, that no, also no, part that's, of that's the exactly. dynamic it's part of the dynamic in multiple different ways right like so for let, let's go to the structural part of it the structural part of it is that uh development as a business still has a heavy heavy uh colonial veneer to it that needs to be stripped right and and there are uh people who are pointing that out and stripping that down world over right it has uh the the um you know if you think of the international development community i e the un structure etc there's still a fairly discriminatory like international versus local hierarchy that these institutions are structured under so i mean yeah the development sector orientation is bad first of all secondly you have sort of um the elite privilege that speaks or you know the the way political elites at the way for instance populist ideas have been sold right so one of the the arguments that used to to come from from administrative elites was that look people don't who vote don't really know what's good for them their air go democracy is a little bit overrated that's you know? still the debate right biryani ke liye vote that's the debate that's still the debate and i have uh, found because i started out as um, an elections researcher when you know when we started to really look at political economy stuff i was a development sector person before that but uh, when i started researching elections one of the things that i found was uh, that every voter has a very clear idea of what they want to vote for right and the rural voter has a has remarkable clarity on what they want and what they need and it's that lack of state responsiveness that basically you know if the state were would have to make people shareholders and would have to deliver on those responses then these are elites that need to be incentivized in some other way to let go of some of that state capture in the interests of the public good right those benefits have to be demonstrated in some way however if but when you have a context like pakistan it is complex it is hard for people to understand the people that they pull in to make sense of the pakistan context are administrative elites and 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 administrative elites end up and playing broker to the international community right saying 
we will tell you how things need to be done. And, and often that sort of um, the incentive structure for the administrative elites to demonstrate that they have followed very inclusive processes are not there. You can get away with doing focus groups with people, speaking to a couple of people, you know, hyping those up in reports. And that's done. Like you have technically low, it, it considered inclusion and you have looked at, you know, uh, gendered and you have looked at the inclusion of marginalized communities, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But that value for money argument, even for the taxpayer whose money is actually funding that development is, is a stretch. However, we are now and, and no wonder the sector has declined, right? No wonder the sector hasn't to, to, to developing, uh, to um, sort of countries that actually fund developing countries. To the taxpayers of those countries, the sector hasn't been able to demonstrate now that there is a time of genuine economic hardship all over the world. No wonder this is the, all of those resources are shrinking. So for a country like Pakistan that primarily hedged its bets, in uh, the uh, in in geopolitical rents, as you said, and also hedged its bets as as and and certain elites hedged their bets with you know the international development actors and and sort of creating and and using that to to also further state capture. Um, we are are now without. This is now moving to an environment of scarcity for them. And so the biggest danger in Pakistan is the contest that go, is, is going to exist um, between elites themselves. And what better demonstration have you seen than the last two years? Yeah, no, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head and on the international development sector itself, right? Like one of my, because I primarily look at the econ side, um, mm -hmm. My exhibit A of that is I don't know how many World Bank loans have been given to the FBR to build tax capacity. And we are still in this era where the IMF report came out two days ago, where it is flagging yeah. the issue about tax collection and revenue mobilization. And I'm like, well, this money may be given to Pakistan in uh, what are called low interest rate loans, but these are loans nonetheless borrowed against future generations of Pakistan taken in by the administrative elite in this example, the FBR, um, to reform and collect more taxes from the people of Pakistan. But clearly, they've continued to fail. But the donors continue to fund it and give more loans borrowed against the future generations of Pakistanis who are not even able to ask that question. I don't know if any point in time there's been a parliamentary debate about, okay, yes, are loans liye hain. Is the impact assessment? Kya hai? Can somebody show that to us in parliament? No, that's not part of the debate. And I think that 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 goes to reinforce the point you were making, which brings me to the final part of our conversation here. You mentioned Khura Hussain. Khura Hussain wrote a fantastic piece. I'll link it in our description. The title is The Tale Without the Plot. And in that he says, quote, fact is the country can no longer afford a modern state. It cannot even afford to operate its own economy because doing so depletes the reserves or drives up the debt burden even higher. Somewhere, somebody has to wake up and realize that this path cannot continue, end quote. Which, again, this article I was joking with Khurram came out of some of the conversations we've had internally about the state of affairs, which is the question I have for you. Given your work, given your engagements on the ground, do you sense across the elites, right, the way you've defined them, do they even recognize that the status quo cannot hold or be sustained? Because my view from the outside in is that the recent SBA with the IMF only reinforces the moral hazard problem that Pakistan is too big to fail. Therefore, kahin na kahin se, koi na koi hume paise de hi dega. What's your view on in this crisis? Is there a shift that you're seeing among these elites that they need to change the status quo? Yeah, I saw that question. I hated you for asking that question. <laughs> and the reason is because I think it, it, from observation, from conversations, from, you know, engagements that I've had, 
it's that that question kind of forces you to confront it, right? And and what I'm seeing there is something that I find far more dangerous. While elite capture has grown, right, in that 20 year period where the war on terror was funding military elites, right? And the development money that was coming in was reinforcing the power of administrative elites. And then the state of Pakistan, and then there was also a fair bit of, there, there was actually some, some valid rationale for the for regulating the third sector, the the, the international ING, uh, INGOs, which was the uh, Nassar's Interior Ministry pushed the law changes. I think in twenty fourteen fifteen. Yeah, yeah, but there, there was a fair bit of, you know, like for somebody like me who comes from a position of do no harm, there was actually a lot of stuff going on in that period between 2006 that, I mean, I think even the congressmen of that time would not agree with, you know, for, for the kind of human intelligence gathering that was done. I mean, there are famous examples of it, but, you know, we, we had some front row seats to see some of that stuff go down and it, it was really, really, really unethical. But uh, besides the point, with the regulations on the INGO sector, then again, you had civil society capacities shrinking, right? But in that 20 year period, the, the reality that I also have to confront is that the decline in the education system and Pakistan's very defensive posture, domestically, the limitations on the kind of discourse that we have had, it's led us to a point where over this time, over these two decades, educational institutes were declining. The capacities of the administrative service were declining. And the capacities of the military were also declining. These are institutions. I mean, that might, I, I, I'm, and I'm saying this, I mean, I want to be and nuance this, is that these institutions, uh, and this is a separate conversation, but I see that decline in other countries as well. So Pakistan isn't isn't um, an outlier here, but I'm not saying that you know these institutions can't perform their core functions. They absolutely can, but what you have is um, a greater evolution and a better career trajectory for conformists everywhere forming. Right. Uh, for and and the Pakistan Pakistan's political economy basically at the core of it, it's personalities in leadership positions who are taking very autocratic decisions. There's more and more pressure on those personalities to distribute scarce resources. So within that those structures, even if somebody gets it. My main thing is that people who have come out of the education system, like in the in in the Zia era and after, so some people who are my age who are in their forties, a lot of them don't get it, and the generations that are coming up now also don't get it, uh, and the generations that will come after will get it even less. That this and and we are stuck in a system where they're also without the incentives to do so. And they are now without partners to do that. So I'm agnostic on the fact that the military elites at the moment are the senior partner and other elites are junior partners. And we're not really focusing on an accountability of the elites. I am much more concerned about the fact that there is no champion for the public good anymore. There's fewer and fewer people every day who understand what the public good is. And that's why you're seeing less and less public good arguments being made, right? It, we know that public good arguments sell, but they're so self-serving in the way that they have been demonstrated. They've been nothing more than populist instruments, right? So the idea is this, you can control your power, contain your power, as in you can continue to grow your power. 
you can sustain your power and all you have to do is demonstrate that you have fed the poor. Yeah. Natural disasters honge, relief dena logon tak. But the power structure itself is there's just no incentive for that to shift at the moment. And as resources get more and more scarce, then elites start to eat each other. Which is what we're seeing now, I think. Which is what we're seeing, which is what we're seeing. But also, I just don't have the patience for international elites to come and tell us that story. I understand we're taking their coin, so they're entitled to have an opinion on it. But my God, this is the system that you built. You came into a context, you found it as is, you figured out who are the easier people to deal with. Again, these are conversations now that people are also having about Afghanistan, right? Uh, you're talking about, you know, a, a, a structure that was essentially very, very centralized. And from a governance model, was that uh, the most inclusive and the most sustainable one in the long term? No. But was it in the interests of the occupying power? Yes. And could you say it at that time? No, because you weren't really ready to call an occupation by its proper name. So here we have, you know, elites contesting over scarce resources and very little incentives for, for uh, that to change over time. Unless somebody comes in and makes a very useful public good argument that's supplemented by the, the how and why and sells it to the public and then the public starts to demand it. And then you have start to show little demonstrations of that. Yeah. I Where the public uh, gains, they engage. It's quite a bleak picture, right? I think it's uh, it's it's one of those things that at least I don't see even a recognition, even among the, as you described it, the ones that have the at least have to demonstrate some contribution to the public good, i.e. the political elite. Even they don't seem to be able to do that. I think the latest, you said BISP, I would say the new variation of that is BISP plus Metro. And metros are great. I love it. They should be subsidized. But is that creating opportunity for the many? Uh, not really, right? It's not mm -hmm. the fundamental, solving the fundamental problem here. It's not solving the health problem, the education problem, the economic local development problem um and and but it's just seen as a means to say okay i'm now go achieve metro they did that yeah asari se apni factory tak ja sa kya agar aapke paas factory ki naukri hai um yeah. but i think uh thank you for sharing your thoughts on this i think it's very thought provoking and interesting to look at the outs yeah please go ahead yeah, the, the one last nuance that I wanted to add is that one of the, the I find it it's a little bit ironic when, you know, people are blaming business elites and political elites. And there's one sort of aspect of, of their, uh, their ethos that gets ignored, which is political elites and military elites, of course, the political elites, military elites, business elites, a lot of them have hedged their assets outside, right? But for the political and business elites, the ones who have resisted a little bit have been the ones who've been able to afford it because they have hedged some of their resources outside. So there's also that aspect that we tend to downplay. Yeah, no, that, that's a fair point. And that's the that's the insurance policy. Yep. Uh, and I mean, I think also in the political elite conversation, one thing I would also add at the end that we often forget or in the mainstream discourse doesn't get talked about is that the coercive elements of the state have been leveraged time and time again to neutralize um, political elites that are more, that are less conformist, let's put it that way, right? So Pakistan's history is filled with examples through this entire era where the international war economy was supporting autocracy, where the autocrats then neutralized across the board, including in Punjab. I think we again miss that point. We will people when they talk about the neutralizing of local genuine political leaders, they'll say Balochistan, Sin, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, even Gilgit Baltistan. But they'll forget Punjab also has a history of that, particularly southern Punjab. Um, but they've been neutralized. So this idea that the politicians themselves don't 
want to confront this reality is also flawed because the history books are filled with examples of people that have bravely resisted and many of them have died while resisting um, uh, this tendency. And I think, again, it's an underspoken or underappreciated part of history in the mainstream discourse, at least. Um, before, yeah. before I let you go, um, I always ask my guests, uh, you know, this, what are two or three books you would recommend people read can be on any topic. Um, but I always ask this for my guests. Oh, I'll, I'll stick with the, with, with the theme actually. And I'll stick with like plugging my friends. Um, but I, I mean, I value certain people and their opinions and their work just because I learn a lot from them. And, you know, I'm not really, I'm a researcher. I'm not really sort of, you know, uh, in the public domain as much, but it's, I find some people like, uh, who also, I mean, um, work in this space to be really, really, really smart. So I, you know, Neela for Siddiqui, Maria Mufti, Sahar Shafkat have edited a book on Pakistan's political parties. I think that's a that's a great uh, place to start. And then, of course, Alhan Niaz's book on power and governance in Pakistan. Like, there's no better expert on the administrative elites than Alhan. So I would recommend those two. Thank you for that. We've had both of them on, and I think Dr. Niaz is uh, <laughs> the most the most uh, uh, visited guests of a guest of ours on the podcast. So, um, yeah. you know, he's always a, a an amazing person to talk to. In fact, when you're talking about the history and the second part of this conversation, we've had sort of him explain to our audience. And if folks who are listening have not heard that, please do check out that podcast episode about how the colonial era structures continue to this day in Pakistan about extraction and the role of the bureaucracy in that extraction and how it is not a 47 was not a break. It's a continuing paradigm that we need exactly. to then understand. So exactly. he's awesome for sure. And Nilofer, that book on political parties is also amazing. Uh, so thank you for those recommendations and uh, thank you for your time. I know you have to celebrate belatedly your birthday. So happy birthday <laughs> to you as well. Thank you. So uh, and appreciate you joining on a Thursday evening and we'll hopefully have you on soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Uzair. <laughs>